So look, just a few of the things that we'll run through this morning, just quite quickly what MSA actually is. Um, what influences your MSA grading result? Now, this is quite an important point, I suppose, because we're, we've been talking across all sectors this morning about how to reach the best po reap the best possible benefit out of your business. So for those of you that are involved in the meat industry, at the moment on livestock grids, you might be seeing some really quite magical figures that have a five at the start of them. So, you know, $5 a kilo and above for cattle. It, it hasn't been seen of, or hasn't been seen, I don't know, ever really. So, but the really important thing to realise is that obviously, like everything, no such thing as a free lunch, to get that $5 a kilo or more, your animals have to meet the market specifications. And MSA, if you like, is simply another market for your cattle. And I'll talk about the importance of that shortly. So we'll spend a bit of time on what's important to your MSA grading result, why it's important, and if you've got some problems with that in your herd, just some things that you might like to consider the next time you can sign some animals. And then hopefully we'll get to the end and you'll go, well, that's something I'd really like to have a go at. And I can run you through how you might actually join um, the MSA grading scheme. MSA is an eating quality system. It's an initiative of Meat and Livestock Australia. So we've got quite a few acronyms flying around there. MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia, is a fully producer-funded organisation. MSA, Meat Standards Australia, is, an, is an initiative of MLA. So my role as the operations manager for MSA is to make sure that the integrity of that system is kept intact at all times. Because what we want people to be able to do is See that little logo down there? Whenever you see that on a piece of meat, that should say to you that you're going to get a consistently good eating experience out of that piece of meat. Now, as well as that logo there, you will see a brand. Because all MSA is, in some ways, I like to describe it, is the bridesmaid to the bride that is the brand. So a couple of your local abattoirs around here have got some MSA brands. And, and their logo and the story behind their brand will be front and centre. That's the most important thing. But sitting down off to the side will be that little MSA logo. And all that that means, all that that means to the brand, is that, that you will be getting a great consistent eating experience each time. It's going to tell you on there how to cook that because that's one of the biggest issues that consumers have because we have some really quite weird names for meat. You know, rump, we probably all realise what, what to do with that. Cube roll, maybe. Cube roll's fillet. So, you know, everyone kind of knows that they like it, but they may not know they like it when it's uh, marketed as a cube roll. We have some other cuts of meat, one of them called chuck. That's a hard sell. So, you know, what we need to do, I suppose, is, is take some of that focus out of the the name of the cut and just simply have the consumer look at it and go, okay, I need to grill this. Or I'm looking for a casserole, I need to look for some slow cooked meat. So we're just trying to take a bit of the guesswork out of it as well. How did MSA come about? About 15 years ago it was recognised that red meat consumption was falling and, and red meat consumption sadly continues to fall. So one of the initiatives that was taken was to go around and I suppose do some market research and find out why that was. And one of the main reasons that came out was inconsistency in eating quality. So what MLA did, and look over a 15 year period there's been about $74 million invested into this. What they've done is we go through and we sit down groups of people like yourself and do sensory testing. Now sensory testing is really just a flash term for getting people to eat meat and tell us what they think about it. Now when we say some people, there's been 100,000 of those people at last count, they've eaten 700,000 samples of beef. So as far as a data set goes, we've got a sizeable data set that we can make really good decisions with and, and I suppose stand by those decisions because there's, there's plenty of times when they're challenged. Now we'll talk today about some things that impact on eating quality and some of those things can be a little bit hard to hear depending on what your production system is. So what we just need to realise, I suppose, is that when we talk about these things that are important to eating quality, we know that they're important to eating quality because those 100,000 consumers have come back with something on their sheet that said, 
I didn't actually enjoy that piece. It wasn't as tender or it wasn't as juicy or it didn't have as much flavour as I would hope for a great eating experience. What the clever boys in the white coats at MLA then do is go back through and try and find out what it was about that piece of meat that, that had the impact. And that's what we've been able to find and that's why we now have this MSA grading model. Each and every carcass after slaughter um, is graded by, by a human, funnily enough. And they go in and they measure different things that we know are important to eating quality, like marbling, like the age of the animal, whether or not it's been treated with a hormonal growth promotant, whether it came through a sale yard, um, what other things, the amount of fat on it, the age of the animal, uh, the sex of the animal, all of those things have an effect. Once they've captured that information in their little data capture unit in the chiller, the MSA grading model, which is a beast of a thing, calculates over those data inputs that have been collected and it spits out a preferred cook method for every single cut in that carcass. So again, even for the processor, it, it takes the guesswork out of it. They know exactly how it should be packed so that they can get and sell a premium product every time. So, the glycogen bucket. Now, this is probably going to get just a tiny little bit sciencey, but only for a short period of time, I promise. So, glycogen. Glycogen is simply the energy that we have inside us. We all have it, all living animals. Where it becomes important to the MSA grading scheme is that one of the main reasons that people don't buy red meat is that when it's on the shelf, it doesn't look red. So if it's dark, consumers just do not like dark coloured red meat. So one of the things that we immediately kick animals out on when they're graded in the chiller is if their meat colour is too dark. So you probably think, why are we talking about this ice bucket then? So I'd like you to imagine that this ice bucket is your animal as it's heading off to the, to the abattoir. So we needed to have plenty of glycogen because if it has enough glycogen after it's been slaughtered, it will have enough lactic acid. Enough lactic acid, the meat won't be dark. So it is, a, it is in some ways quite a simple story and a fairly topical one at the moment because there's only one way in for glycogen and that's what we eat. So we, we just ask that animals have a nice, steady or rising plane of nutrition throughout their life. Now that's really easy for me to stand here and say, it's not really easy in times of drought and especially in, in certain places around Australia at the moment, that steady or rising plane of nutrition can be difficult to achieve, but it's about doing the best you can in the circumstances that we have. Now we don't make any differentiation between grass and grain whether or not you feed your animals grain or grass only, that requirement will come from your processor. They'll have brands, specific brands that they'll want to go specific ways. Just know that for us, they need to have enough to eat to keep that glycogen bucket nice and full. Now, the way that animals lose glycogen, there's really only one way, and that's through stress. But as you can imagine, there's lots of different things that can, that can stress an animal. So MSA is often referred to as, oh, it's bloody complicated. You know, I've been doing MSA for years and years and I still don't quite understand it. If you remember two things, feed your animals well and treat your animals well, because that works really well with this glycogen story here, then that's a good head start for MSA. There's more to it than that, obviously, but that is certainly a great head start. So we're going to talk about some things here in the next couple of slides that reduce the amount of stress that animals go through. Because what we have to do is that you will all have different, you'll have different properties, you'll have different ways of doing things on your property. But because then when your animals all converge at the abattoir, we actually need them to be, well, a little bit standard. So we do have some things that we will suggest that you do. We have some other things that we'll tell you to do. And the reason for that is that when your animals arrive at the abattoir, the processor has got an idea that, well, look, they've all been raised with this end game in mind, so we should expect that there'll be a little bit of standardisation across them. Just on that point there too, I suppose, it's important to note that when meeting any kind of market specification, you're probably going to have to put some thought into it. And what I mean by that is that very often we'll have people who go into MSA for the first time and we get the phone call and they go, oh, my grading results were shocking. 
And when you go back and talk to them, you go, well, you know, what, what, what type of animal do you have? And they'll tell us. And you go, oh, that's pretty good. And, um, you know, did you not mix them for the... Oh, no, 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 mate. Well, you know, we had two mobs there and we got the best out of that and the best of that and we mixed them together the day before they went and then the agent came and he said, they'd be great for MSA. So he signed me up online, we sent them off and their grading results were ordinary, to say the least. We're going to find out in a minute that what I've just outlined there is not the ideal pathway to the processor for MSA cattle. So, it, it, look, it requires some thought and like, I suppose like everything that's good, it's not always easy, but just a little bit of thought and I suppose knowing what you need to do hopefully will give you a good head start. So the glycogen story, I won't talk about it for much longer, I promise. Plenty to eat, treat them well and then that gets you over that dark cutting, um, what would you say, hurdle. Just know though at the moment, and, and I was overhearing a couple of conversations at morning tea, what you might find at this time of year when your pasture starts to turn, so at this end of winter and at the other end of winter, it might look like you've got plenty of grass there, and I am no expert on grass, let me tell you, but it is something that we find, is that it might look like there's plenty there, but it just hasn't got much guts to it. So it is just something to be aware of, that they just might need a little more nutrition-wise at this turn of the season. So just keep that in mind. All right, so what do you need to do to be an MSA producer? You need to be registered. And to do that, you go on to the MLA website, you hit the MSA link and you register online. Now, it's not a particularly onerous process and some would say that it's actually too simple. But what it actually makes you do is go in, read a little bit of what we'll talk about today, answer a few questions and there might be some of you who when you do that will not believe me, but all the answers you need are in what you will have just read. We get a lot of phone calls from going, how am I expected to know this? Well, you know, you're meant to do that bit of reading at the, at the beginning. But the most important thing, I suppose, is that um, whilst there's not a lot to registering, it is important to know the basics. We just used to, we used to, to be honest, just email forms out and go, fill that form in, send it back in and you're registered. We were doing... All of, all of the industry to service by doing that. So now we do ask people to go online. We are not complete mongrels though. So if you have a dreadful internet connection or are just not comfortable doing it online, give us a call. We can, we can work something out. When I say give us a call, that's the MLA Brisbane office and we'll be able to help you with that. Um, now we ask that your cattle be kept on your property for a minimum of 30 days of dispatch. And we ask that they be run as a single mob for 14 days prior to dispatch. That has all got to do with just the way that animals socialise. So I always like to put it a little bit like an office environment. There will always be someone who thinks they should be boss. And their behaviour, by trying to portray that, will stress others in the environment. There'll be others who just don't want to be boss and they want to be left alone. So within about 14 days in a paddock full of cattle, that's all happened. They've all sorted out who's who in the zoo. So they're not stressing and losing glycogen by that kind of um, socialisation behaviour. One of the biggest mistakes that people can make was that one that I just spoke about earlier, having the two mobs of really good cattle and going, well, actually, maybe not. Having two mobs of cattle and then trying to determine the best of each of those mobs and going, we've got this sorted out, we're going to take five from there and five from there and then we're going to put them in the one pen overnight and then we'll send them off. Overnight, guess what happens? Old mate who was no chance of being the boss before goes, well, we've got rid of Rodney, I reckon I'm a chance. <laughs> so, and it all, you know, it all happens again. So it's a really, really, we, what we always say to people when they call us with poor grading results is, what was, you know, what happened in that last 24 hours? Because people can put a lot of good work in and it all go to ruin in that last 12 to 24 hours. So sorry, running as one mob, no mixing of cattle within 14 days of dispatch. Now they're recommendations because we can't, we don't know whether you do that. You'll find out whether or not you're doing the right thing in most cases when your grading results come through. Cattle have to be slaughtered within 48 hours of dispatch from property. And that should be really quite achievable around, around this district. 
Um, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you realise that there are some places in Australia where that's just not possible. They just can't get them to the processor in, in time. So that's an important one, but I don't think you'll have any trouble meeting that. Just, and look, this is more paperwork, I'm sorry, but when you send MSA cattle, you'll you will have your normal national vendor deck. You will also have an MSA vendor declaration. So I'll, I'll show you where you can buy those, if you like a paper version at the end, or you can again go onto the MSA website and download an e-deck. Most of the processes around here will ask you to provide an animal with a particular MSA index score. So that index score brings together all the things that are important to eating quality. So getting all of these next few things right will have a really positive impact on your index score. So if you just think about these next few slides are going to help your animals grade better, I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. So HGPs. Now, the reason that people use these is to get more weight into their cattle. Now, in days gone by, let's say, weight and teeth or dentition were probably the most important things on a grid and they are still really important to some markets and weight is always going to be important to any market. The only problem, if you like, with HGPs for the MSA scheme is that they have an impact on eating quality. Now, again, this, this won't get too sciencey, but just a little bit. So when an animal dies and goes through rigor mortis, there's a couple of things happen. Two enzymes come into play. One's called calpain, the other one's called calpostatin. Calpain, if you like, is the good guy, because that actually starts to break down the collagen crosslinks in the meat and it makes meat more tender. And it's why we ask for all MSA meat to be aged for at least five days, but sometimes up to 35 days. And the model, again, works that out. We tell the processor, and then it's up to everyone in the supply chain to make sure that, that the meat gets that aging. So that's, what, that's so Calpane can do its job. Calpane has a mate, though, called Calpostatin. And what Calpostatin does is that it inhibits, if you like, the breakdown of that meat. Now, in most animals, that's a really quite even ratio there. So calpain's doing its job, breaking the meat down. Calpostatin's pretty much saying, well, you know, steady on there so that we don't just end up with a bag full of mush. With HGPs, you artificially increase the amount of calpostatin in an animal. So it takes longer for that meat to age and get to its premium eating quality. So that's why if you tick on your MSA vendor declaration that it's been treated with a HGP, you will probably lose five points on your index. Now, if you're not involved in MSA at the moment, you might be sitting there going, oh, okay. But if you are involved, you'll know that that's probably on most grids, I don't know, 40 cents, 50 cents a kilo. It's quite a bit. What you have to weigh up with that though, and I have to say this, is that there might be another part of that grid where that extra weight that the HGP is going to give you is possibly going to be of more benefit to you. So don't discount that either. But from a purely MSA point of view, HGPs do have a negative impact on eating quality as well as that increased calpostatin. It decreases the amount of marbling, which we'll talk about in a minute, is not particularly great, and increases ossification. Again, not great. All right, so marbling. Now, I don't know whether you can see that picture there. It's not a particularly great one. That is an extremely high highly marbled piece of meat. Now to be part of the MSA program, your animals do not need to look like that, but they do need to have some marbling in them or intramuscular fat. Now, some animals will have more potential to marble than others. Some breeds will have more potential to marble than others. Just while we're talking about breed, one interesting point is that, you know, obviously in the meat industry, pretty much any morning tea conversation revolves around breed. It might be interesting for you to know that it's the one thing, well, one of the things that we don't capture in the MSA system. Because re realistically, we're interested more in the attributes of the animal rather than possibly even the, what that breed, what attributes it brings. So it's just worth knowing. So look, the reason that I suppose it's so important to an eating quality program is the fact that you know that you're eating beef rather than lamb or pork, if it's not a particularly, you know, if it's not a particularly fatty piece, um, that breed flavour is in the intramuscular fat. And it also stimulates saliva. So what that means is that when you're eating the piece of meat, you're kind of going, well, that's juicy and it tastes good and I know it's beef. So when we talk about an eating quality system, 
That's why it's so important to MSA. What I would say is that as far as making sure that your animals do marble, yes, some breeds will marble better than others. But you also need to be aware of that some in that breed will have the potential to marble better than others. So just a little bit to my earlier point about possibly thinking quite some way back whether or not you might want to be involved in, in MSA. When you're out there buying your bull and you know it, it, it's walking around the ring and you're going, that bull has everything that I like in an animal, maybe have a look in the catalogue and see whether there's anything in there that will give you an idea of that animal's potential to marble, like an estimated breeding value or a DNA test, whatever it might be. Because the thing is, is that if you know that that animal has a... So what you'd be looking for as far as an EBV is a good IMF figure in their EBVs. Because what that does is you kind of go, OK, well, I know that by buying that bull, its progeny are going to have that potential to, hire, to marble just that little bit higher. You kind of give yourself a bit of a free kick start. So start thinking about it back then. I am in no way saying that you should just be going out and looking for an animal that only marbles. Pick it on anything else that you like. It's good siry head, it's spring or rib, whatever it might be. But if there are figures there that show it can marble, please take that into consideration. Ossification. Now this is a, an interesting one and if you haven't had any exposure to MSA, you might not even know what it is. So ossification is the process of cartilage turning to bone. And it's what we use to measure the age, or the maturity, I'm sorry, not the age, the maturity of the animal. So when you get your MSA feedback, there will be an OS figure on there. It's a figure between 100 and 590. It's one of the few things in the world that you don't want the highest score. You want to be closer to 100 than you are to 590. This is OS here, these little red bits. And so that's actually got quite low ossification. But that's what we use in the chiller to measure the age of your animal. Now there's two things that, that cause ossification. Old fella, like myself, fully ossified. So age is certainly the main consideration there. 13 year old version of me sitting down the back there, his os score should be considerably lower than mine. Now if he'd had a tough life though and we kept him off the feed for you know a month or so at a time, which we haven't had to do yet, um, his OS score could be considerably higher than what you would expect for his age. So just to bring that back to the land of cattle, um, that it's, a really, it's a really important point because when we say about keeping them off the feed for a month, sometimes circumstances might mean that you don't have the feed that you need for a month or two at a time. So just be aware that sometimes people will get their feedback sheets back and go, geez, that animal was only, you know, 18 months old and look at how high its OS score is. If you think back throughout its life, maybe there was a time there when it had a setback. It might have been lack of food, it might have been illness. A good dose of three day will increase an animal's OS score. Now, sadly, there's a lot about the ossification story that is hindsight. So the hot standard carcass weight is after they've done the standard, I'll use another term now, the standard OS meat trim. So it's just to make sure that Every animal after slaughter has the same parts removed before it's weighed as it leaves the, uh, as it leaves the slaughter floor. Um, you will need to hit a weight. That weight will be determined by your processor. The one thing that I would share with you here as a bit of a hint, get it up to that hot standard carcass weight as quickly as you can. So you'll be looking for that early maturing animal. And the reason that's gonna be of benefit to you, the quicker it matures, the less of those collagen crosslinks in the meat, the less work that calpane has to do, the less ageing, the better your result is. It kind of all, all flows back. Hump height. I'll just, I, need to, I need to mention this because we're, we're kind of probably far enough into New South Wales where this doesn't become as big a concern as it is if we were presenting anywhere in Queensland. But tropical breed content, which we measure as hump height, has an impact on eating quality. Now, we talked before about why uh, the importance of breed. So anything I say here is, is not meant to influence you at all on the type of animal you might breed because people have that breed for lots of different reasons. So as you can imagine, when we say that tropical breed content has an impact on eating quality, that can be a bit controversial. So what I'd like to do is just bring it back to the science. We talked before about calpostatin and the impact of calpostatin 
when artificially added to an animal with HGPs. Tropical breed content animals have higher levels of calpostatin. So the reason it can sometimes look like they don't grade as well in the MSA scheme is that we have to, because of that extra calpostatin, give them extra time to age. So that might sometimes be reflected in a slightly lower index score. We place a lot of focus on, on the negative impact that tropical breed content has in, in the MSA program. I'd say maybe focus on the others. Uh, the, the, the two there, there's, processes, there's things that the processors can do. They can hang them a different way, called tender stretch. That has an impact. What you can do, though, I suppose, is focus on the positives. Find that marbling. There will be animals with a high, high tropical breed content. That marble, find them. And if you find them, find out who Dad was and make some more. You'll also, it's important, as we said before, to turn them off as quickly as you can to keep that ossification score low. So that's, it's quite a long story, as you can imagine, hump height. Just know, though, they can grade but keep your marbling as high as you can, your MSA marbling. That's another tip for any that are in the program or looking to get in the program. We measure Osmeet marbling, we measure MSA marbling, only MSA marbling is used in the model.